Okay, hey everyone. So this is that advanced lecture that I was promising, um, and it's on the topic of how sort of the archetypal components of the human psyche, uh, particularly the anima, the animus, and the shadow, all interact to kind of give us our conscious experience. Consciousness is a product of these th three things kind of interacting in the psyche. Um, and I do mean that this is an advanced lecture. This isn't easy at all. Even me trying to like come up kind of like what I was going to say was so difficult that I had to like really think about it. Um, because I kind of, you know, I, I know this stuff intuitively, but it's so hard to articulate it. Um, but hopefully throughout the course of this lecture, you'll understand what I'm saying. Uh, I'll just put this picture up so that you don't have not, you know, you don't have a blank screen to look at. Uh, sorry if you hear any thuds in the background. Uh, some, there's some work going on. So, um, hopefully that won't interrupt too much. Um, but again, uh, th this this lecture kind of requires a frame shift um, in terms of what you probably know about these concepts. And so it kind of re requires a kind of a reinterpretation of, of things you probably priorly assumed as priorly a word, I'm not sure. Um, but anyways, this picture here uh, is a motif that many of you should be familiar with if you've seen my, uh, my um, uh, series on the origins and history of consciousness, which is that of the sort of separation of the world parents. The fact that the masculine component represented down here and the feminine component um, are being separated from each other, and that's what causes consciousness to be born in the first place. Um, and of course, I explained what this is all, what's going on here from a psychological perspective, um, but there's an interesting parallel from, from the neurological perspective, which is represented by the brain itself. Um, and of course, you guys should be familiar with this division in the brain. It's something that I talk about a lot on my, my channel, especially with respect to the bicameral mind. Um, and it's the division between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. There are other divisions in the brain, for example, the prefrontal cortex compared to like the, the sort of lower regions of the brain. Uh, but the one we're focusing on now is the, is the difference between the left and the right hemispheres of the brain. Um, and I personally align the animus, the masculine side of the psyche with the left hemisphere and the anima with the, with the right side. And I have good reason for doing this because these two hemispheres have different personalities. Um, they perceive the world in slightly different ways, you know, they're not exactly identical to each other. This isn't just a copy of the other one. They actually have slightly different functions and slightly different personalities and slightly different ways of perceiving the world. Um, and based on my research, I have pretty much concluded that the animus or the masculine side um, is very closely associated with the left side and the anima with the right side. Um, and there's this quote from Jung, which will demonstrate what I'm, what I'm talking about which is, I use Eros, so Eros is again associated with this anima side, and Logos is associated with this anima side. I use Eros and Logos merely as conceptual aids to describe the fact that a woman's consciousness is characterized more by the connective quality of Eros than by the discrimination and cognition associated with Logos. So we'll just stop there for a second because, uh, again, he's describing kind of two different two different ways of thinking, the connective quality of Eros and the discrimination and cognition associated with Logos. That's very, very uh, indicative of the difference between the hemispheres because the hemispheres also are like that. This one is more associated with cognition and discrimination and kind of, um, you know, focusing very narrowly, um, whereas this one is associated with kind of a broader attention. You know, it connects things. It... it it, it sees the bigger picture. It connect, It kind of finds connection between different parts of a, of a sentence, for example, or, 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 you know, of the world in general. So, you know, that the, this difference that he's describing here is very characteristic of this difference between his hemispheres, which has led me to the conclusion that the animus is in the left hemisphere and the anima is in the right hemisphere. Now, this might be a bit of a confusing point because you might be wondering where exactly is the animus in this part of the brain? Um, and it's, it's hard to say for exactly I would probably give it to the sort of prefrontal cortex. But again, it's not exactly that the animus is associated with one part of the brain. It's more like this whole system of the right hemisphere working together, or sorry, the left hemisphere working together is what gives us the kind of animus personality that we associate with it. Um, and the same thing is with this side, you know, something about the right hemisphere working with different parts within itself gives us the kind of anima experience that we have. Um, and another thing which might be confusing, which might be, require a kind of frame shift from what you previously learned, is that you may have learned that uh, only men have an anima and only women have an animus. Um, but again, it, it and, you know, that that is actually what Jung writes in his original work. But in, in my opinion, it makes more sense to think of a man and women both having an animus and an anima. Uh, the reason being is because you as a man, for example, if you're a man watching this, um, you you do have a masculine, you know, there's, there's a dominant masculine part of your psyche and that that exists inherently. It's not an unconscious function. It's, well, I mean, I guess it is technically an unconscious. It, ri it arises from the unconscious. Um, but essentially you do have a masculine side and then your feminine side is less developed. And then it, for the majority of women, not all women, of course, um, the, this anima side is more developed and is more kind of characteristic of their personality. 
whereas this animus is kind of less developed and you kind of have to bring it up um which is why we say it's unconscious but it um as we'll see his sort of saying that you know to describe a woman's consciousness is characterized by eros um is a bit of a misnomer and we'll see that you know shortly um but again, one of the things I was saying before was that they have different personalities. And so they kind of pull in different directions, the two hemispheres. They have different priorities. They see the world differently. And so they, you know, they're doing different things. They're not acting exactly in concert with each other, exactly, you know, cooperatively. They're kind of pulling apart from each other. And it's this pulling apart, which, as we'll see soon, is actually what gives birth to consciousness. Our consciousness, your consciousness right now, for example, you're hearing me speak right now, it depends upon the fact that the animus and the anima within you are doing different things. They're, they're engaged with what I'm saying in a different way. And that's what creates the totality of your conscious experience. So if I deleted this anima part from your brain, your consciousness would be very different. In fact, it would be very fragmented. You would be able to understand what I'm saying, but you wouldn't be able to understand the whole thing. You, you know, you'd be able to understand each of the individual words that I was saying, but like kind of putting the whole together the whole picture would be very difficult uh whereas if i deleted this animus part it would be you'd be almost like in a dream where like you could hear what i'm saying you could kind of understand it but you can't really relate it to anything that you already know um uh, so, you know, important func important parts of consciousness are lost when either of these two things are lost. So that's why I'm saying that both of them are required for consciousness. Um, and of course, the shadow is also required for consciousness, or at least it plays a very important role in consciousness, um, which I'll demonstrate shortly. Um, and, um, you know, you may have also heard that the, that consciousness is more closely associated with the left hemisphere, and this is true, and that the unconscious is more closely associated with the right hemisphere of the animal, and that's also true. Um, and so one of the things you have to realize about consciousness, I guess I'll get this out of the way right now, is the fact that consciousness is is a new, is a relatively new thing. It sits on a foundation of unconscious content. So if, if, for example, it sits on a foundation of these two unconscious um, parts of yourself, the animus and the anima. Um, and so consciousness is actually a result of multiple unconscious processes working together to give us the conscious experience. Um, and so in that sense, un the unconscious really is superior to consciousness in the, fa in the sense that it comes first and that it's, it's, it's this kind of unconscious realm working in a specific way, which gives us this consciousness, um, which again is a bit of a frame shift. And furthermore, this is kind of, okay, this is kind of hard to explain, but essentially, uh, your consciousness, um, it depends on you being unconscious of <laughs> of what you're conscious of. Okay, so that's that's a very confusing statement. But essentially, what I'm trying to say is that like your minute, like, for example, your let's use this simple sentence as an example. I use arrows, uh, so you could be conscious of each kind of component of this sentence. Um, but of course, to understand the whole thing is kind of an unconscious process. So again, your consciousness depends upon the unconscious kind of handling of all of this information um, and working on all of this information together, which causes you to feel like you're conscious of the of what this sentence is saying, of what this paragraph is saying. Um, again, I'll, I'll go into more detail about that in a minute. But what I want to focus on now is to kind of get this shadow bit out of the way. So this is kind of my map of the psyche. It's not the entire psyche. Um, and of course, the, you know, when we draw the psyche, we kind of space things around. But it's not. It's, this isn't what the psyche actually looks like. It's just a diagram to kind of demonstrate what I'm talking about. And there are various components here. The persona, we don't need to focus on that. Consciousness is kind of the, the, the theme here. So I want, to, want you, again, the, the whole theme of this lecture is the fact that this consciousness is a product of things going on down here, which kind of you know, which working together gives us this brand new thing. And the shadow is a part of that. So here's the shadow axis. It's composed of the personal shadow and the archetypal shadow. Um, hopefully you guys know the difference, but if you don't know the difference uh, between these two things, um, I'll describe it right now. But basically this archetypal shadow is related to a kind of function inside the psyche, which is very negative. So it's kind of like... Um, it's kind of how we respond to things that are unfamiliar. So whenever we encounter something unfamiliar, there's this kind of shadow reaction where our brains kind of negate it, and we don't we don't we don't view it in a positive way. We view it in a negative way uh, because some, something that's just unfamiliar is potentially dangerous, and so we kind of reject it like that. Um, and of course, if are there are parts of our personality which we also reject. So again, this archetypal shadow can act upon things which we observe in the external world. So for example, if you see someone who's potentially dangerous, you have this archetypal shadow, which is, this is basically like an enemy complex. It's like the idea of the antagonist is already inside your psyche. So you project this idea onto them um, and then you view them in a negative light and view, the, and view them as potentially dangerous. It's like you're negating them. 
in a sense. You're not viewing them in a positive way. You're viewing you're viewing them in a negative way. Um, and interestingly, there's an there's, there's an interesting connection between the animus and the archetypal shadow, which I'll come to in a second. But the, this personal shadow is essentially anything part of the personality which we're also negating. So anything which is a part of you. So for what's a good example? Like if you if you perceive yourself to be like a I don't know, like the life of the party and that you think everybody loves you and that everybody likes you. And then like, let's just say you encounter evidence that that's not true, that some people actually don't like you. Uh, well, this archetypal shadow may act upon that information to just kind of discard it. Like, oh, that's not true. That's bullshit. Like that's, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't fit my ego conception, which is up here. And so it gets relegated to the personal shadow. Um, and, and again, you know, when we talk about Jungian psychology, we're mostly focused on this personal shadow, but the archetypal shadow is also very important. Um, and again, these things are functions inside the brain. I know I keep reiterating certain points, but it, but it's really important to keep stressing it. Um, these things operate inside our brains whenever you're conscious of anything. So like right now, you're listening to my voice and you hear what I'm saying and you hear what I'm describing. You see this mouse moving and stuff and you see this diagram. Each of these three things is com contributing to your experience of that. Um, and they can operate in different ways. You know, I, I describe the shadow right now as kind of projecting upon dangerous things. But another way the shadow operates is projecting upon information in general. So right here, I wrote the sentence, wolves are a type of cat. Um, hopefully, you know, I don't need to explain to you that this sentence is wrong. Um, but you probably hopefully recognize that right away. Wolves are a type of cat. That's clearly not true. So what happened right there when you what 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 happened right now when you recognize that this was false? Well, what happened was is that you kind of have you kind of have information inside your brain, um, so you know what wolves are, um, and so when you see that they're a type of cat, you immediately recognize that's wrong and you negate it. So your so your shadow function right now is actually operating upon the sentence, or it did it did operate upon the sentence when I first explain when I first showed it to you. Uh, to negate its actual meaning because clearly this is wrong um, and so there's something not right with the sentence and so your archetypal shadow kind of recognizes that it's like this is this doesn't this doesn't match my preconceptions so instead this sentence does match your preconception at least i believe it so i think they're a type of dog i don't know if that maybe a type of canine would have been better to write there but wolves are a type of dog so okay that that matches the conception which you previously had much better um and this is where I can bring up what the animus is doing. So the animus is, again, the part of, it, it's more closely associated with consciousness. So again, recognize the fact that this animus is kind of more towards the front, where the anima is more towards the back. Um, so what I'm trying to indicate by that is the fact that the animus is more closely associated with this consciousness, which it is, um, and the anima is more closely associated with the unconscious, which it is. But remember, you know, again, it's, it's, I feel like I have to keep re reiterating myself because it's just, it's such a, sorry, it's such a complicated subject, which is that, um, your conscious experience is sitting on top of an unconscious mind. And so when you see that the anima is associated with the unconscious, that doesn't mean that it's not associated with consciousness. It's just that it has a different function in terms of bringing about your conscious experience. Uh, anyways, back to this sentence. So, um, what the animus does and what the left hemisphere does in general is that it has certain preconceptions about the world um, and certain re-representations of the world. In fact, it's very closely associated with the language, you know, logos is um, kind of a function of the way, you know, it, it's the way you, it's the way you perceive the world in terms of how you expect to perceive it. So you have certain ideas inside your mind and your animus re-represents those ideas. Um, it, it's, it, this is kind of hard to describe, but it's, you, again, it's, it, it's, it's, it's closely associated with language, and language is a is kind of like a map of the world. So you have different words, and those words map onto different concepts. Wolves are a type of dog. You can eat, you can understand each of these words because they kind of map onto a specific thing, and then that's how you understand the whole sentence. Um, and of course, the animus is always looking for for information which kind of conforms to its to its preconceptions, um, and it kind of has difficulty whenever it doesn't. So if I go back to the previous. I go back to the previous sentence. My computer's lagging, sorry. So again, you negated this one because it doesn't kind of conform to what your animus was expecting. But this one, it's like this one does conform. So there's kind of this positive reaction. You know, it's basically confirmation bias where something which you previously be previously believed is being confirmed and that's what the animus is doing. It's, it's trying to constantly view the world in terms of uh, things that, is previously, that it previously knew. Whereas the archetypal shadow, it rejects information based on its unfamiliarity. The fact that it doesn't doesn't conform to what you previously knew. So it's kind of a rejecting function. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, you know, that's what's that's what's happening with the animus. And I'll describe what's happening with the anima a little bit later, because uh, the anima is also involved in you understanding this sentence. 
But let's do an example here. Um, hopefully this isn't too controversial for you guys. Um, but, <laughs> but so, you know, I could write down this sentence, Joe Biden is an amazing president. Or I can write down this sentence, Joe Biden is a terrible president. And I know that I have a fairly um, diverse audience. So some of you probably align more with this view and some of you align more with this view. Um, and, you know, you know, I don't think either of these statements is necessarily accurate. It's probably somewhere in between and it depends on the, you know, it depends on the context. But either way, uh, your brain, when it saw this one, let's just say you disagree with this. When your brain, when you saw this one, again, this information is does not conform to, to what you expect. You know, you don't believe this. You don't believe that Joe Biden is an amazing president. So you may have negated it. You may have thought, no, I disagree with that. And that's kind of what your shadow is doing. It kind of just, it's like, Ugh, it does, it, it, this doesn't conform to the, to the way I see the world. Um, and so I'm going to reject it. But if this version does conform to the way you see the world, if you if you agree with this statement, it's your animus, which is kind of, you know, it's imposing the way you think about the world onto this statement and checking and seeing whether there's a match or not. You know, that's how it's actually, that's actually how it's able to focus. That's something I probably should have mentioned. The animus is very focused. It's very, um, again, it discriminates, but, you know, it, how do I describe it? It's, it's very, um, because because of the fact that it re-represents what it previously knew, it kind of negates everything that's around it. Um, if that makes sense, it's it's very it focuses on the kind of details. It's very detail oriented um, in that sense. Um, but in any case, again, if this if this statement is the thing you agree with, it kind of like it, it, it actually releases some hormones in your brain caused by your animus because there's a match between the way you perceive the world and information which you're getting. And that's, that's very satisfying. Um, in fact, all cognition is like that. All cognition is an attempt to kind of force an idea which you already knew onto the world at large out there. And again, if you don't, if it doesn't conform, your shadow negates it. Um, and again, when you negate something, it doesn't disappear. Like you, you perceive this, but like your brain kind of does consider it a little bit, especially this, this side of the brain, um, this side of the psyche, it, it does consider this possibility, which is say if you disagree with it, but again, your conscious ego is more like it prefers this one. And so that's what gets represented to you. But the unconscious is more open-minded. Let's say let's, it's more, um, open to the possibility that this previous conception might be false. Um, and so hopefully that demonstrates what I'm talking about when they say this archetypal shadow negates um, while the animus confirms. Um, and of course, that's kind of dangerous thing because again, you're just kind of looking for things which confirm how you previously viewed the world rather than uh, potentially accepting new information. But of course, there's a, there's a function, there's a reason for that because again, if I go back to this example, this statement is blatantly false. And so it makes sense to negate this because you don't want information which is just blatantly false and against your against your prior assumptions because you know oftentimes your prior assumptions are, are, are fairly well grounded. Uh, not always, of course, and you know there's a big debate about that. But anyways, that that's kind of what your psyche assumes. So uh, hopefully that kind of clarifies what's going on there. So here's another sentence. Now, okay, this the sentence conveys information. So let's go to the information which it conveys. Again, this is a, this whole thing is about consciousness. So I, w as you're listening to what I'm saying, I want you to keep thinking about how is it even possible that you can understand these words? Like how is it like what's going on inside my brain that allows you to understand what I'm talking about? Um, and of course, like you probably got a caught a glimpse of it just now when like I showed you that last example with the Joe Biden thing. Um, but here's a, here's a sentence which requires us again to kind of utilize the shadow. This is again, trying to focus on the shadow here. The left hemisphere is closely associated with consciousness, but the experience of consciousness depends on both hemispheres. I, I believe I already said that, but again, so what's, what's going on with the sentence? So the left hemisphere is closely associated with consciousness. Okay, so we have one bit of information kind of uh, given to us in the first part of the sentence. Okay, so we know, so what this is implying is that this thing is associated with this thing. Okay, good, good enough, fair enough. But, and this is the key thing, the language always has words that are negatory. So not, but, no, you know, rather than, things like that. Things that contrast. So what you have to do when you interpret this sentence is when you hear this but, is you kind of have to negate the previous information which you had. So it's like, okay, you're given this information, but... And then, so you kind of have to negate it in a sense. And again, that's the shadow. So you're given information, which kind of, let's just say this conforms to what you were expecting. Um, so it activates the animus, but then I put in this but function and this but tells you that the archetypal shadow has to kind of negate what was said before and turn and, and kind of replace it with a previous con with a with a new conception not a previous conception so this new conception is the experience of consciousness depends on both hemispheres okay so like so again this again what i'm trying to focus on here is the fact that the archetypal shadow is acting on information in the sentence in order to kind of give you kind of inform you what's going on and in fact it's a very useful thing to use use the shadow um, in terms of understanding 
because one of the best ways we understand is to contrast with other things. So like this thing is not this, but rather this, uh, you know, so like I, it's contrasting two things. And because you're contrasting them, your shadow kind of negates one percep one conception um, in favor of another. And that's how you kind of learn and kind of, you know, change information that you have. It's like, a, it's like a modifier. It's a modifier that works inside your brain. So hopefully you're seeing that. And it's hopefully you're kind of seeing what this whole lecture is about. The fact that the, the, the shadow is operating on information inside your brain to change it. Um, so, so I, so I'll move on to this slide here, um, which, um, if I remember what I, what my plan was, I think I wanted to also kind of do what we just did, but with this sentence. Um, and so here again is another sentence. Um, this is actually pulled from the book that I'm basing a lot of this off of the master and his, um, the master and his emissary, great book. I'm kind of rereading it over and over again to actually make sure I understand it fully. It's a very complicated argument, but again, it aligns more or less with what I'm saying right now. In most ways, in some ways not, but um, if I, you know, I'll discuss those probably at a later time. But again, here's a sentence which you can understand. And what's, how is it even possible that you can understand what this is saying? So let's go over this. Much of our capacity to use the world depends not on an attempt to open ourselves as much as possible to apprehending whatever it is that exists apart from ourselves. Okay, interesting. So this not right here is again, another negating function. So we, so it tells us much of our capacity to use the, to use the world depends not on, you know, whatever this is. So not on an attempt to open ourselves as much as possible to apprehending whatever it is that exists apart from ourselves. So what this not does is negates this thing. So you build, you construct this in your side, your mind, whatever this sentence is telling you, and then you negate it because it's telling you not that. But instead, and then you replace it with something else on apprehending whatever I have brought forth, brought into the, for myself, my representation of it. Okay. Um, and then this last sentence right here, this is the remit of the left hemisphere and would appear to my, to require a selective, highly focused attention. Um, okay. So this, in, this information itself is actually relevant to what I was saying before. So I'll just quickly go back here, which is the fact that the animus is always re-representing the world. It has a view of the world already inside its mind. And it kind of just imposes that upon the world to see if there's a match. Um, and that's what he's describing here. Um, so. Uh, again, so when we understand a sentence, it's a very complicated process. And right now I'll try to focus on the animus and the anima. We already kind of understand what, this, what, the, what the shadow is doing. It kind of negates our, uh, our understanding of the sentence or, or it kind of detects the bullshit that there's something wrong in the sentence and I have to negate it with the Joe Biden example, for example. Um, but in this, in this sort of um, you know, what, what your brain is doing when you understand the sentence is first you have to understand each individual word. So if I isolate a word, like the word capacity here, if you just read the word capacity, it has a different meaning on its own than in the context of the sentence. Again, context is kind of like a modifier. And, do, you know, based on the context, you can kind of negate certain meanings of the word capacity. So for example, like the, the capacity of a jar, that's clearly not what this, this word capacity means in this context. You know, perhaps it's related, perhaps they, you know, share a a common origin but capacity in this sense is more like the word ability you know rather than the capacity of a jar or the capacity of something you can fill with a fluid um, and so you negate you can negate kind of uh, meanings that are irrelevant to the to the context being said um, but what the left hemisphere does is that it knows what each of these words mean so hopefully you understood every single individual word um, in the sentence you know perhaps some if you're not very good at English some of these might be um, a bit uh, uh, unknown to you, but assuming that you understand each word, um, uh, essentially, uh, here, I'll, I'll, I'll pull up the, so yeah, this definition of capacity is repressed because it is not relevant given the context. That's what I was saying before. Um, but if I do another example, so for example, the word dog is not in this sentence. Um, each, what I'm trying to say is that each hemisphere and each, the anima and the animus interpret this word in different ways. So the anima, or sorry, the animus just sees it as the word dog. And the word dog is just, it, it, it's almost like the word represents the thing itself. So a dog, again, is a, is a very particular thing, but you don't need to like think about anything related to a dog in order to know what that is. So it's like the word itself represents the idea. Um, and you can even have the idea without the word, which is how it's possible to be conscious of something without, you know, you don't necessarily. So for example, like right now, you're probably sitting down while watching this or standing up, whatever. But like you can feel right now the, the, the feeling of the floor touching your feet. So you're conscious of that right now, right? Um, and what that implies is that you can kind of have the idea of the floor touching your feet uh, without the words. Of course, I use the words to kind of 
draw your mind to that actual thing so that you be conscious of it. But again, the, the concept itself can kind of exist without the word. But the important thing is that the, is that the word, <coughs> excuse me, my, my voice, I'm starting to lose my voice. The word maps onto the idea without necessarily kind of, you know, broadening itself. It's a very focused idea of the word dog. And that's kind of how we interpret words in a sentence. You know, each of these words in this sentence, you, you can, uh, they, they're kind of, um, kind of map on specifically to the, to a very specific definition, which isn't, you don't need to like think deeply about, for example, the world in order to understand much of our capacity to use the world. You can see that the context itself kind of, kind of gives you what you what you need to know about this word world in terms of what this what this whole paragraph means um and again that's what your animus is doing your animus is kind of like a one-to-one -one mapping of the concept world to the idea world but the right hemisphere the anima is doing something a bit different so the word dog again it's just a one-to-one -one mapping of the concept dog to the idea dog but again the word dog also kind of conjures up images of, 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 of perhaps a particular dog or of like certain dog breeds or like or like things you associate with dogs like the fact that dogs are domesticated animals as opposed to wild animals you know all those things which you could potentially associate with the word dog is contained in your unconscious mind um, and of course, this is different for each person because we each have different experiences. Like my ex experience with dog or is with my dog, for example, my specific dog. And so that informs how I think about the word dog. But for you, it could be different. You could be, <coughs> excuse me, you could be somebody who doesn't like dogs or something. And so like this is, this provokes a negative connotation or like you could have like three dogs and that provokes a, a very specific connotation for you. The point being is that like none of these things are are conscious until I bring them up. They're kind of in the unconscious mind. So like this, I, this idea dog maps onto other ideas um, through connotation and through kind of um, association, uh, but not consciously. They're kind of in the unconscious and they can be brought up when you do so deliberately, but they're kind of just there in the back of your mind. Uh, very similar to the fact that the word capacity um, can mean one specific thing, but it could also be connected to this other thing, um, which is why the unconscious mind is used to kind of broaden our understanding of the world, whereas the conscious mind is used to kind of reinforce our previous understanding. Um, so let's see what I have next. Yeah, okay, so this is what I was saying before, that the that the, the brain, the different hemispheres interpret this word differently. Um, and again, this this hemisphere is just a one to one mapping of the concept dog onto the idea uh, onto the word dog, whereas this is like the, all of the all of the things which the word dog implies. Um, so, anyways, what I have here is kind of how the two hemispheres actually understand the world, and this is kind of the meat of what I wanted to say. Whereas the the left hemisphere understands kind of these individual words. So my mouse isn't working right now. Great timing. Um, the, the left hemisphere understands these individual words and it kind of it kind of stitches the whole thing together so that you can understand the entire sentence or the entire paragraph. So like when you're conscious right now, you're not it's not like you're conscious of this entire thing. You're conscious of the bits. Consciousness is a very small part of our of our experience. Um, you can only be conscious of like something like one percent of all of you perceive. All that you perceive uh, so consciousness is a very small thing and so it kind of only makes sense for your consciousness to kind of grasp these individual words rather than the whole thing but at the same time your unconscious mind kind of does understand this whole thing once you've read it so after you've read this whole sentence it's not you have this feeling that like the sentence makes sense um and of course that feeling is associated with the right hemisphere which kind of so, okay, let's, let's do an example. So much of our capacity to use the world depends. Okay, so I, I took you through each of these words. And for a moment, for, you know, in the present, you were conscious of the word much and of and our and capacity and to and use, okay? But at the same time, you're unconscious. The second you move on from one word to the next, all of this kind of goes into the unconscious mind. So you're conscious of this word, capacity, but everything that happened before goes into the unconscious where it's kind of stored within the context of this sentence. Um, and that's what the right hemisphere is doing. That's what the anima is doing. It's connecting all of these all of these things. First of all, okay, well, uh, let's be more specific. First of all, the, the conscious mind is perceiving each, of, uh, each individual word. But there's another process going on in the unconscious mind which connects all of these things together into a coherent whole. Again, consciousness divides the world. So it divides these individual words um, from the whole sentence. But the unconscious mind it, it then transfers that information to the unconscious mind, which then puts it together into a holistic thing. Which is why, you know, 
you know, for example, you uh, you probably understand what I've been saying this whole time. You understand what the theme of this lecture is. Um, but of course, you're not conscious of everything I said previously. Like, I, I, if I go back to all of this, it's like now I'm just bringing it back to your mind. But you did perceive it, and it is kind of in the back of your mind, right? So it's in the unconscious mind. It's in it's involved in the anima. <coughs> or rather, the anima is involved in kind of piecing it together. Again, that's another thing I should probably focus on, is the fact that the anima is engaged in this process as well. It's the thing which is stitching together the meaning of this whole sentence. It's the thing which actually puts all of this together so that you feel like you understand the entire thing, even though you're only conscious of one little bit of information at the time. And that's the feeling of understanding. When you understand something, you understand it consciously, like this word representation. You understand that consciously as one thing, but in the unconscious, it means another thing. And that it's that feeling of, of it being connected to other ideas, which is the feeling of being conscious. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, I'm coughing so much. Um, but, and this is uh, equivalent to Julian Jane's idea of paraphrans. So paraphrans are ideas you associate with this, um, with this word, with any sort of idea. And, and they're in the unconscious. They're not really, they're not really in the front of your mind. They're in the back of your mind, but it's that connection. It's that unconscious process of that information being connected to things which are on your unconscious mind, which gives us the feeling that we understand anything at all. Um, and that's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere kind of doing different things, kind of interpreting this information in different ways gives us the feeling of being conscious in general. Um, but again, you might have to be wondering why I, why I said before that the, if I go back far enough, that the, the left hemisphere is more associated with consciousness. How do I explain this? Uh, for a couple things. So again, animus means the masculine side of the psyche. And it's the part of you that's very will-directed or it has a it kind of it, it pursues the will that you want um and it does so by very narrowly focusing on the world so again it narrows your focus whereas the anima broadens your focus um but this narrow focus allows you to do very specific things because if you're kind of just focused on everything and your attention is broad you can't really do anything at all except kind of just go with your instincts because you know there's no you don't have a very specific plan but the animus with its re-representations of the world as you as you perceive it kind of can direct you and take you um to you know do very specific think for example if you work in an office job that's that requires like very specific tasks for you to be done it's your animus which narrows your focus so that you can do these things um rather than your anima which kind of you know which is involved is definitely involved but this is kind of what this is kind of closer to the conscious mind whereas this is closer to the unconscious mind but again it's the totality of these things working together which gives you the feeling of being conscious um, you can ho hopefully you're beginning to see why I consider this an advanced lecture uh, rather than something which is easy to explain. Because even right now, I feel like, <laughs> am I making sense? Hopefully I'm making sense, um, at least to some of you. I can imagine some of you are probably still confused. And that's, you know, that's understandable because this is, I'm, perhaps I'm not articulating this properly. Um, but anyway, so... So hopefully that's your you're kind of getting what I mean by these hemispheres doing different things um, when you understand a sentence, for example, and that's how you're able to understand the sentence. So again, I'll, I'll go back to this example because it's such a good example. You understand this whole lecture, but it's not as if your your minute moment to moment consciousness is of the entire lecture. The entire lecture has more or less gone into your unconscious mind, and what I'm saying in the present is kind of just modifying the information which you have in the unconscious. Because again, you don't remember everything that I said before, but you kind of do remember it unconscious. You can bring it up if you kind of yeah um, work at it. Um, okay, so but hopefully I, I've made my point. I don't want to repeat myself too much. Um, okay, so here's another point that I want to make and another thing which the anima is doing. So again, I, I express the anima as the kind of thing which stitches together the different elements of the sentence so that the whole sentence makes sense rather than the individual words. Um, and of course, that's that's because the anima is more more closely associated with the unconscious mind. This is true of the anima in general, but it's also true of the the right hemisphere in general. The right hemisphere of the brain is is first of all it's uh, associated with the preconscious. So when you dream, for example, when you have a dream, that's I think I have an image of a dream to demonstrate that. Yeah, this is my dream image. Um, <laughs> that that's actually what's happening is your your right hemisphere is engaged with the kind of dream images that you're experiencing, um, and so it's preconscious. It's not exactly conscious. It's more more like it's 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 more like it's um it's hard to describe but it's like it's it's a very passive feeling where like you feel like you understand something but it's not like you're actively trying to trying to grasp it um it's just kind of like a passive feeling that comes to you um it's like watching a movie and then um you know you don't you you can just kind of lay back and be passive you don't have to like actively engage yourself in what's going on in the movie unless you're like specifically interpreting it uh, if you know what i mean like the, it, it, it's just a very passive experience 
And that's why we say it's preconscious. Um, but also the right hemisphere is actually more deeply connected with the deeper parts of the brain than the, than the left hemisphere is, um, which gives me, which means then again, very true to the fact that this is the anima. And this is, this is more evidence that my, that the model I'm proposing here is right. Um, Cause the anima Jung described it and various Jungians describe it as the window to the unconscious mind. I think I, did I write that down somewhere? Yeah, the, our, the animal is our window to the unconscious mind. So when we access the unconscious mind, it's through the anima, it's through this passive side, um, which allows us to experience the images of the unconscious mind. It's allow, it allows us to experience dreams, for example, but it's also what allows us to kind of just daydream. And like, I, I remember describing before, hopefully you've seen that video. Uh, if you've seen the, my video on the transcendent function, this is totally related to that because um, any sort of higher consciousness depends upon going through the unconscious. Because again, this, this side um, is always re-representing. So it's kind of us operating on the assumption that it already knows everything that it needs to know. Um, and so it's very closed minded. It doesn't want to accept new information because that means kind of rewriting the previous conceptions. The animal, on the other hand, um, is very different. It's it's kind of open to the possibility that there is new information out there that's worth gathering. Um, and this arrow that I drew here is actually kind of another function of the anima. So the anima kind of takes information which has been kind of pushed into the shadow, pushed into the, the, the unconscious. It takes that information and it acts with it. Um, it, it, it engages in kind of a, a reorganization of these contents to kind of see if there's any useful information in there. In fact, that's kind of what our dreams are. Our dreams are kind of just representations of psychic processes that were rejected by consciousness, but the anima is thinking, okay, maybe there's something here that's actually useful. I'm going to try to re-represent it back to the conscious mind to see if anything can be learned. And that's what the anima is doing. It's connecting everything in the unconscious mind to see if it can kind of construct something meaningful out of it. And by doing so, this gives us the potential to learn things that are new. Um, so you might be wondering, so consciousness is, again, very complicated phenomena. Um, and of course, I associate consciousness as being a re-representation of things you previously knew. But the assumption is, is that you can learn things in general. So how is it possible to gain new information? The answer is the anima. The anima is the more open-minded part of your mind. It's, a lot, it's you know, again, that's that's why it's associated with femininity. It's not like this this arrogant animus that kind of just assumes that it's right. It's It's more open to the possibility that its prior assumptions were wrong. And so that's why, you know, when people apologize, it's a very feminine thing. It's because it's involving their anima. Um, and, um, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to go that far. But I guess I'll focus on this point up here, which is the anima and the animus can be charged with energy. The more energy, means more activation of this function. Um, and so what I mean by that is that when you're using your animus, it's like when you're, for example, when you're highly motivated to do something and to do something very specific, it's like, for example, I have a deadline. I need to meet that deadline. So I need to focus my energy very specifically on this thing to do. It's your animus, which is doing that. And it allows you to do that. It's a, it's a very important function, actually. You know, I've been talking kind of shit about it, but really it's actually very important. Um, whereas the anima is kind of more passive, more, you know, more open. And so it's, it's not like specifically focusing on specific goals. It's just kind of like lets in whatever information that can, that it can get. But when this anima is charged with information, that's kind of when we can, sorry, when this, when this anima is charged with energy, that's kind of when we, uh, experience the, the unconscious. So, um, if your anima is charged with a lot of energy, um, this can actually be a very psychotic state where you're kind of experiencing the unconscious and you can't really control it because all these unconscious images are just coming up, um, because your anima has been giving too much information, sorry, too much, um, too much energy. But of course, giving it some energy, and of course, this is not something you deliberately do. Actually, you, to be fair, you can actually deliberately induce this anima state <laughs> using certain drugs, but I'll, I'll leave that for another discussion. But let's just say, like, for example, you can, char you can charge your anima with more information. It's this anima state rather than this anima state, which gives you the ability to perceive new information, integrate that new information, and in fact, to change your personality. Uh, that's what I was discussing before. I have a video out where I discuss how the anima is actually able to transform the ego. How it's able to do that is because it breaks down this previous ego conception, takes in new information, accepts that new information rather than rejecting it as this an this animus archetypal shadow axis does, and then it allows the new ego to be reborn. Um, and an important function of that is the fact that the animus is also active because, again, the animus needs to be the thing which solidifies this ego um, because otherwise you just won't know who you are. You'll just be kind of like an animal. <laughs> um, but yeah, hopefully that explains everything that I want to discuss. I'm not sure if I articulated it properly. Um, and hopefully that's, I think that's long enough. But again, I'll, I'll resummarize. So each of these three functions, the animus, the anima, and the archetypal shadow, each play a role in your conscious experience. The archetypal shadow negates. Uh, so information which appears to be wrong, which doesn't conform to this 
animus expectation is negated. The animus itself understands the world in kind of like a one-to-one -one mapping. So it's kind of mapping the world to see if it if its conceptions um, make sense um, and if its conceptions are being uh, reinforced. But the anima is also engaged in this process because while the animus kind of is very minute and looks at these individual bits of a sentence, the anima constructs the whole thing um, through the unconscious to, to make this whole sentence, this whole paragraph mean something. Um, and it's that feeling of meaning, which was what, you know, it's what we feel when we feel like we understand something. It's actually the anima, it's actually the unconscious. Um, but of course, again, these things are interacting to give us this conscious experience. Again, our minute consciousness is more closely associated with the animus because when you, when you're conscious of something very particularly, that's your animus. So like if you're conscious of the word the right now, that's your animus. But if you read this whole sentence, it's your anima that's actually constructing the entire meaning while your animus is kind of looking at the individual parts. Um, and again, and another thing, and then the last point that I wanted to make was the fact that the anima engages with this unconscious information to transform it, and then that's what potentially transforms the, the ego and allows us to learn anything new rather than just re-representing the things that we previously knew. Um, okay, so hopefully that uh, explains everything that I was trying to say. Hopefully that's understandable enough. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please leave them below. I'll try to clarify. I'm, uh, it's, it's, again, it's very hard to articulate. Like I know, I know exactly what I'm saying intuitively. One can say through my anima, but to actually explain it in animus terms through words is very difficult. Uh, but hopefully, I, I've done a good enough job. Um, again, if you have any questions, if anything was unclear, please leave comments, and I'll try to answer them. Uh, but thank you for watching. If you've watched up, to, up until now, um, take care. And uh, again, thanks for watching. Peace.